Sorry. Okay, well, welcome to session, I think, number seven or eight of our consideration of seminar 18. Today, we're actually going to take a bit of a, um, a detour from the main seminar because in the day that we're supposed to study, it's actually a commentary on a written text that Lacan wrote around the same time, uh, which is a, a text that's dedicated to a consideration of literature. And it's a kind of play on literature. It's kind of taking the terre in French, which refers to earth and swapping that term out. Um, and obviously playing on this Joycean notion of the letter and the litter and this kind of trash bin thesis that he develops very early on in this text. So our objective tonight is to go line by line in literature and take it slowly, hopefully finish it. If not, we can finish it later. Um, we're relying here on Richard Klein's uh, translation which provides actually four different versions of English translation in columns, the, French, the Freudian School of Melbourne, Jack Stone, Danny Nobus, and um, Beatrice Foxton and Adrian Price's translation. So I think we will rely on Danny Nobus's translation because his notes at the end have proven to me to maybe be like the only compass or key rather to really making sense of this text um, in part because this I think is an aphoristic text of Lacan's. In other words, he's giving these little tight um, truly literary aphorisms that are condensed with profound meaning uh, and references which are very difficult to detect uh, because he's, he's not uh, necessarily being generous with what the references are to refer to exactly. Okay, so sometimes he's referring to an obscure surrealist journal from the 1950s, right? Other times he's referring to a French author, uh, but that, that we're unfamiliar with and things of this nature, right? Nobis takes every single obscure reference, okay? And he clarifies what it's about. So that alone is a great service. Um, so yes, but before we begin there, I want to turn the floor over to Aaron to talk about where we left off last time because Lacan was about to develop um, a kind of preliminary overview of the graphs of sexuation and we were getting into um, some logical conversation, but we kind of cut it. I think we were getting tired, so we cut it short. Aaron's taken a lot of notes on that. So may we invite you to make a few comments about that, please. Certainly, and so I can put this in the Dropbox afterwards um, in case it's a little, you know, unyieldy. Um, so uh, yeah, again, these are mostly preliminaries, so not very formalized, but anyway. Um, so in laying out this, his scheme, um, and this is, you know, the, uh, what is it, March 17th um, or 13th, I, I, I don't know, anyhow. Um, in laying out his scheme, Lacan opposes himself to two positions in which he which ended up ultimately occupying roughly the same position, logical positivism and Aristotle, both guilty of disseminating an ontototology or truth about truth or what Lacan calls in subversion of the subject, the doctrine of double truth. Um, for his part, Lacan can only ultimately overcome a similar impasse with regards to the hypothesis of incompleteness, his own hypothesis, that might indeed be posed as a truth about truth if he or we can pose it at a metacritical level of the genesis of structure. In any case, here is the usefulness of Lacan's approach, turning both the resources of Aristotelian logical square and logical positivism, qua Phrygian logic writing, Phrygian logical writing against themselves in one fell swoop. So in words, um, 
Guide Le Goffet talks about this in his book, Lacan, The Formula of Sexuation. The Aristotelian logical square, just to like explain that real fast, you've got a universal affirmative and a particular affirmative below that. And then on the right side, um, universal negative and negative particular below that or particular negative. And basically the way Aristotle thinks of these is that um, a particular affirmative is always derivative of the universal affirmative. So like, he, uh, Aristotle does not explore the implications of what you might call uh, the maximal particular. You know, the way we say how in common parlance, even in ancient Greek, when you said some of something, when you predicated some of an object that would obviously carry the implication of not all, Aristotle doesn't think that way. In order to consolidate a syllogistic system, he has to have the particular just be an instantiation of the universal. Um, I'll get to that. So we can first address logical positivism here. Significantly before succumbing to its own totalizing pretensions, the logical writing of logical positivism inaugurates an initial decoupling of existence and essence. The Aristotelian logical proposition joins subject and attribute via copula relates its two as two pre-given discrete entities, indeed saying up the former, the subject, as ultimately a substance, or that which possesses an abiding essence, being. Logical contrast by holding the sentence, and we've talked about this in previous sessions, puts in place uh, in place of the subject, an empty place, the unknown X, which will acquire meaning only subsequently through the corresponding function. Only despite this breakthrough, what logical positivism does not grasp is that, for Lacan, quote, once written, a function is what it is, as Lacan puts it. El Lacan illustrates this via the, um, uh, the, 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 um, Square, <laughs> some of square root equations um, in relation to real numbers. Uh, the application of the variable argument root of second degree equation to the function set of real numbers. For there are cases in which the former, that is the root of a second degree equation, um, uh, yielding imaginary numbers does not satisfy the latter. And thus we cannot write that the unknown is a real number, cannot, as Lacan puts it, lodge the unknown in it, that is the function, i.e. write that X is F. Put this way, that is by invalidizing the function with regard to the argument, um, cannot be taken, this cannot be taken to altogether negate the function of real numbers, however. True and false, yielding an absolute false per logical top positivism, or A, X, bar over F of X, um, or phi of X, um, which ends up finally equivalent to the non-value of the Aristotelian universal negative. Indeed, quite in contrast to Aristotle's logical square, we see in this example that the particular affirmative and particular negative are in agreement now, right? again, root of second degree equation and um, uh, real numbers. There are some, you know, roots of second degree equations that which correspond to the set of real numbers. Again, particular affirmative, particular negative agreement here in contrast to the Aristotelian logical square. Uh, thus, we are far from being able to see, as Lacan puts it, quote, being able to see here the purely formal transposition, the complete homology of universal and a particular affirmatives and negatives respectively. In other words, for Aristotle, the negation only bears on the copula or verb, never the prostiorism, that is quantifier. Thus, the latter remains external to the proposition. Per uh, Aristotle in the Interpretation, it must not be said, not all men, for the negation not must be added to man, for all does not signify the subject is universal, but that he is taken universally. End of quote. So thus it is all men are not doing well or no man is doing well that constitutes the universal negative. Otherwise the quantifier or prostiorism cannot be negated, only contradicted, as in all can be replaced by some, making the particular negative a modification derivative of the universal affirmative and thus presupposing the collection as realized. Um, and I just had like one or two other things we see again, 
Lacan's presentation of the formula here are at variance with his later presentation. You have, for instance, um, on the masculine side, you have the bar of negation situated over the, um, there exists the e, EX, as it were, um, and not over the phi X in the partic in the, um, as in the later formulae. And the way Lacan writes this, um, and that's called a, uh, yeah, that's called a discordant negation, by the way, small point. But <laughs> uh, basically, um, let me see here. Um, some of these notes are a bit um, scattershot. Um, so uh, basically, it, the import of this, Lacan says that it is not for any, um, um, yes, the negation is, uh, not put forward on the basis that there exists some man. Basically, Lacan's whole point here is it, it, compatible with, his, with what he does later. He's just making the point that no man enters the phallic function as phallic per se. So man participates in the phallic function not as a particular, but as an every man or universal. Man's universality is not straightforward, qua essence. However, for he enters into the function as an unknown X, after all, in relation to a third term, the Faust as independent of him. Um, this uh, every man is obtained through the tautom, tautom, I'm bungling the French there, the whole man, which is in the first instance a signifier and nothing else, an artificial creation, symbolically exists only as if the necessary founding negation of the function, the primal father, and thus indeed as existence without essence, and quote, without which man would not be man. That is an essence without existence, given the mere semblance of the phallic function. There's more here. I can happily forward the like notes here. This is a lot to just kind of, <laughs> I realize taken, um, you know, uh, via speech. Excellent work. So it's almost a homology between the way the primal father instantiates um, a, a, a necessary universality of the all applying a certain phallic relationship to enjoyment. And then, then the homology is actually to the, to, to the fact that Aristotelian logic performs a similar uh, form of function. Um, and that, that move right there is really interesting in, in my opinion, because um, it's kind of giving a further level of abstraction to the Freudian thesis uh, of sexual difference, which he will eventually derive from that. Uh, that, that actually this is not merely something which is kind of tied to a biological theory of libido, right? Um, but that, that rather so my question actually would be sort of, um, how is Lacan um, tying the theory? Because he's moving away from, uh, he, he's, he's, he's still operating with a theory of signifier and there's a kind of Saussurian structural linguistics going on, but now he's bringing in this kind of Aristotelian Frege based logical argument. So, um, that's a, that's a very profound move because in, or worse, the next seminar and then in Encore, that theory is refined further and further and further concurrent to his other conceptual innovation around the RSI uh, of the Borromean knot, right? So you have these kind of two new models of theory to account for the core so to speak, edifice of psychoanalytic concepts themselves, right? And I, I know that obviously Lacan was discussing Frege even in seminar three um, or before, right? So, but I wonder actually like in your research from some of your reading of Chiesa, uh, who writes a lot about this, as well as uh, the other author that you mentioned, Aaron, what, what have you learned about um, some of Lacan's later theory of logic. What, what, what's, what's up with it? 
It's really weird. I mean, there's a lot of the latter part of like Chiesa's book I really need to review. It's it's fiendishly complicated. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I mean, again, like I s remarked earlier, it's kind of this, in Lacan does this ingenious maneuver of kind of collapsing, like he, he's both taking on Frege and Aristotle in like one formulation. He somehow manages to balance these two out. Um, again, there's a homology to the Aristotelian logical square, but it completely subverts it. Um, I think the whole point is, you know, for Lacan, I mean, the way Chiesa describes it is as the illogical limit of logic. I mean, he, again, he, 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 it, 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 it's a reflection of Lacan's, I guess, more broad ambivalent relationship to science. And so far as what he, the way he views science is as intensifying the presence of the real via mathematization. Um, but at the same time, it's a, um, marks a um, foreclosure of the real, because ultimately so sci science aspires to the south of the Weltanschauung, a totalizing worldview. It thinks that all of its, you know, disparate disciplines can be brought together finally, and to provide one, you know, holistic view of the universe. Yeah, that's right. And of course, the other big animating um, argument that he wishes to 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 put forward as something which Aristotelian logic and all subsequent logic has not adequately accounted for is precisely uh, the, the 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 preeminent status of uh, that which is written and uh, the status of the written um, as preceding. Uh, uh, in a certain sense, speech uh, or determining speech uh, in ways which have eluded the logician, right? That, that's something at the core of logic has not been able to adequately account for this, um, for example, uh, which in fact is, uh, in, in, I think, referenced in, in what we're going to look at tonight, in fact. Um, Unless there's any other kind of comments about Aaron's presentation, I would like to begin in part because we have uh, we have a lot to go through um, on this text. Any thoughts before we before we jump in, or Aaron, if you wish to say more, please. Um, I'll I'll be happy to post a revised version oh, of yeah. this, uh, in the Dropbox later. Um, no, I, I really actually was taking a lot of notes on um, universal particular, particular affirmative, no. universal negative, negative, like I have a good visual of it, but it would be nice to review that and no. further. Yeah. Um, very cool. Okay, my friends. Very good. Welcome to people that have just joined us as well. Um, let us begin here. So we are, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Um, okay. Here we are. So uh, this is prepared by Richard Klein. I'm happy to say that Richard is actually now out of the hospital. Uh, he's back on Facebook, at least, um, even though I don't spend too much time there. Um, people like him, I, I try to keep up, keep up with. Um, I do intend to invite Richard Klein, um, who actually runs a bookstore in New York City, uh, a street bookstore, which you can, I can give you the address of it. Uh, so that when you go to New York, you must visit him because he's a kind of treasure of, of uh, sort of Anglo uh, Lacanian studies for several decades now worked closely with Bruce Fink. He's uh, worked closely with Adrian Johnson, uh, Ellie Ragland, um, all these kind of American Lacanians. Um, and then of course his uh, Freud to Lacan, the website is all of his, many of his really good translations are there as well, including this one. Um, so this is again, a written text by seminar number eight, day eight in seminar 18, Lacan basically provides a commentary on literature 
this is the text. So instead of just reading that commentary, I thought we would it'd be better served to actually read the text. Okay, so we're going to do our best with this. As I've mentioned, this is notoriously um, obscure as a text. So uh, be prepared for that. I mean, you've already been part of the Lacanian studies here for many uh, sessions, so you're already used to being befuddled, right? Right, John? Indeed. Okay. Uh, so let us begin. This word is made legitimate by the Erno and Meye, Lino, Latura, Laturaeus. It nonetheless occurred to me via this play on words with which one sometimes makes a witticism, the spoonerism returning to the lips, the reversal at the ear. So I think he's take, talking here about a kind of uh, linguistic breakdown of literature as a, as a word, okay? The dictionary, have a look at it, provides me with auspices because it grounds my point of departure. Harding is dividing up here from the equivocation with which Joyce, James Joyce, that is, slides from a letter to a litter. From a letter, I am translating, to a piece of rubbish. And uh, Danny Nobis makes a point that I think it was uh, James Joyce's students that uh, played with this letter to a litter. It was not Joyce himself. Anyways, one will recall that a lady, um, Macinas, in wanting to help him, offered him a psychoanalysis, as one might offer someone a shower. And with Jung, of all people. Uh, by the way, I think James Joyce's daughter was analyzed by Jung, I believe. I could be mistaken about that. In the game I am alluding to, he would have gained nothing there, going straight in it to the best one may, except from psychoanalysis at its end. In making litter of the letter, is it St. Thomas he is thinking of again, as the work bears witness to from beginning to end? Or is it rather that psychoanalysis attests there to its convergence with that for which our era blames the slackening of the ancient bond by which pollution is contained within culture? Okay, just as a nice point here, why would St. Thomas Aquinas be someone in the history of Western thought who understood that a letter has a necessary refuse associated with it? Well, at a certain point in St. Tom's um, career, he abandoned writing entirely and realized that um, there was uh, kind of, you know, this concept of theoria or contemplative life in the kind of um, Catholic monastic order. Uh, he realized that you could say almost in a Wittgensteinian sense, there was sort of a divine silence, which uh, over, overrode um, anything he was capable of doing with letters or words. Um, this is actually very similar to the, the, the realization of the Islamic theologian, um, Al-Ghazali as well, who famously abandoned all writing and simply led a life of pure mystical reflection at a certain age. So the point that um, he's trying to say is that um, St. Tom uh, understood something about the kind of, or, or rather that he abandoned the kind of, um, the, the, the sort of exercise in uh, recycling the trash bin or something that he became sick of it, sick of the sick of the litter in a way. Okay, anyways, and Danny Nobis actually discusses this in his notes. Okay, then we have this passage here, which is of an incredible, incredibly profound reference, if you like, to civilization and its discontents. Uh, and keep in mind a beautiful, beautiful point, in my opinion, which is why does he swap? Terre or earth at the end of literature? Why, why is earth put there? And why is pollution put there? Again, 
this year in 1973, I think is which 71 or 73 in which he publishes this text is actually the first year in which uh, Greenpeace was founded, I think. And the, the first year of the true kind of ecological era, so to speak, of both of, con of consciousness of the earth, preservation of the earth, the finitude of human survival and pollution and so on and so on. You see the point? So there's something beautiful about that, which I think for many grad students wishing to, to write uh, relevant essays uh, having to do with ecology, uh, here is a very nice uh, reference, right? So there's something, uh, yeah, again, kind of almost um, prophetic, I wish to say here. Okay. Is it rather that psychoanalysis attests there to its convergence with that for which our era blames the slackening of the ancient bond by which pollution is contained within culture? Okay. Our era blames the slackening of which bond? Well, one is led to assume that the slackening of the ancient bond is what? We could say the decline of Oedipus, perhaps, the decline of the name of the father. Our era then blames that by which pollution is contained within culture. Okay, this is unclear to me, but maybe we can keep on going. Anybody have a thought on this, please? I had embroidered on that as if by accident shortly before May 68, so as not to disappoint the lost souls in those crowds I draw wherever I pay a visit nowadays. <laughs> Uh, you see what he's saying there, those lost souls who now follow me wherever I go <laughs> to Bordeaux on that particular day. Civilization, I reminded them as my premise, is the sewer. Civilization is the sewer. It must not be said that I was tired of the dustbin to which I have tied my fate. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God, he's so funny. People know that I am not alone in confessing to having received it as a legacy. Okay. People know that my legacy, that I confess that my legacy is tied to the sewer of civilization. What does that mean also? You know what that means, which is that what does the analyst listen to? But the, the kind of the, 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 the excess uh, symptoms, right? The kind of, you could say the refuse that the, the analyst is a receptacle for the rece rece receiving of that, right? It, and he's, a, say again? I, an analyst is kind of like an alchemist, you know, they, they, they turn shit into gold. Right. Yeah, yeah. Then he's about, he's about to make this whole comment about how the peak of Roman civilization was the way that they managed um, shit. So, uh, but why does he say here uh, that our era blames the slackening of the ancient bond by which pollution is contained within culture? It's a very interesting point. It's something also about a kind of very sophisticated theory of the culture war, not this American version of the culture war, but a kind of more uh primary version of the culture discontent right this kind of so it's again it's a return to the civilization as discontents okay confessing or in the ancient pronunciation the assets uh with which beckett balances the debts that make our being rubbish saves the honor of literature and relieves me of the privilege I might otherwise believe I derive from my position. Okay, confessing the assets with which Beckett balances the debts that make our being rubbish, saves the honor of literature and relieves me of the privilege I might otherwise believe. Um, okay, so this, this is a reference to a particular, um, it's not Westward Ho, it's a, it's a particular uh, uh, text of Beckett, 
which escapes me at the moment, I apologize. Um, but he's, uh, uh, what, what, do you, what do you gather that he's saying here? It, which, is, which is what I gather he's saying here, okay, is the same thing he's gonna say next year, which will be the title of his seminar. What is the title of his seminar the following year? The father or worse, the father or worse. Yeah? Which means that um, he has a, uh, an ancient knowledge of the social bond, which is no longer feasible in the contemporary milieu. Um, and that uh, he is a kind of saint that listens to the rubbish of the failure of this ancient bond is some, some summary, although that's not an ideal summary. This is something that I think we could say. Okay. The question is whether what the textbooks seem to be displaying, namely that literature involves cooking up leftovers, is a matter of uh, collocating, so not collecting, but kind of um, collecting and kind of in an order, in written form, the Akri, what would first be chant, spoken myth, dramatic procession. Okay. As for psychoanalysis, it's being appended to Oedipus by no means qualifies it to find its way around in Sophocles' text. Freud's evocation of a text by Dostoevsky does not suffice to say the textual criticism until now, the private hunting ground of the university discourse has received any more clout from psychoanalysis. And you know the reference to Dostoevsky there is a reference to Freud's essay about um, um, uh, incest and the prohibition of incest as a central motif and Dostoevsky, no? um, which again is referring to the ancient bond, even, even by ancient here, the bond then would even be, even be uh, uh, Freud's thesis in Totem and Taboo in some sense on the prohibition of incest, we could say, and the kind of foundation, foundational social contract of the brothers after the murder of the father and so on. Maybe he's even going back that far, I guess. Um, but then, he, but then he says, uh, until now, the private hunting ground of the university discourse has received any more clout from psychoanalysis. So that makes sense. Why does he call the university discourse the private hunting ground? Um, what is it hunting? Um, that's an interesting point. I mean, in some sense, it's, it's, um, um, it's, it's hunting the names. It's, it's, it's effacing the integrity of the name in some sense. Like that's like the kind of, I don't know, like the sacrificial act of university discourse. And by the way, the thesis of the name is introduced later here in a way that's very compelling. So keep that motif or concept in mind. Um, and simply by name, all I mean is that you'll remember the kind of operation of university discourse has to do with this sort of, um, deprivation of a certain form of experience of one's own subjective destitution through castration, but rather like you're, you're sort of, you're deprived of what Lacan would call your own singularity. You're deprived of the S1 in the university discourse and um, all that you're, um, given in, in lieu of that is the S2, right? So knowledge is a kind of functional stand-in for an unachievable form of singularity, at least within it, at least within the university discourse, which is why, like, um, if you're a bureaucrat, which is university discourse, just as much as being a university professor, um, people often feel very shameful about their vitality, right? It's a kind of strange antiseptic zone, right? It's, it lacks vitality in some sense, right? It's your, anyways, this is my impression of university discourse, um, which of course 
the 68ers are suffering from being caught within the university discourse, which is why they're coming to Lacan, and which is why maybe we are also coming to Lacan, right? Um, here, my teaching takes place within a change of configuration, which is advertised by a slogan that promotes the written form, but regarding which other evidence, for example, that is only now that Rabelé is finally being read. I have not read this author. Has anybody read this particular French author? I've always meant to, but um, I haven't got around to it. If anyone has an insight on this figure, I would love to. I'm sure, Daniel, you're familiar with uh, Botkin's uh, Rabelais and his world. It's a famous work of um, literary criticism. I read it in my yeah. Mike on Days as a Northern Renaissance art historian. Um, yeah. It's all about, you know, the carnival that, you yeah. know, kind of upending of the social order, as it were, which takes place on certain festival days, yes. Uh, and Botkin, like, he views this as integral to mm. um, Rabelais' whole fiction. Rabelais, yes, yes. That's very interesting. I'm working on Flaubert this summer. Um, <laughs> but all of these, 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 these 19th century, well, Rabelais is what, is 17th? Uh, no, 16th. 16th, 16th century. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not my area of expertise, but nonetheless. Okay, that's very helpful background. Um, okay, shows it. Okay. okay. Rabelais is finally being read. Shows a displacement of interest with which I am more in tune. As an author, I am less directly involved in it than people might imagine. Am I agree? A little more ironic than one might think when it concerns either reports a function of conferences, or let's say open letters, where I bring into question a facet of my teaching. In any case, far from compromising myself in this literary love fest, with which the psychoanalyst who is short on ingenuity tries to distinguish himself, I denounce therein the attempt, which invariably demonstrates that his practice is unequal to the task of motivating even the slightest literary judgment. It is nonetheless striking that I open this collection with an article that I isolate from its chronology and that it concerns a tale there, which is itself quite special in that it cannot enter into the consecrated list of dramatic situations. That of what happens to the posting of a missive of who is aware of its forwardings and of the terms that allow me to say that this letter arrived at its destination after, via the detours, the letter had suffered therein. The tale and its account have been sustained without any recourse to its content. And here he means that um, there is no recourse to the actual content of the letter that composes the purloined letter in Poe's uh, short story, which is an important point. Um, so it arrives at its destination, but the content of the letter is uh, not, not of issue, not an issue. In this, it is all the more remarkable that the effect it has on those who in turn have it in their possession, as justified as they may be in laying claim to the power it confers, may be interpreted as I do as a feminization. We remember this, right, which is, he wished to return to this point, which is that uh, uh, the letter, as we know, when he speaks in encore about the feminine, performed what he calls a masquerade, right? Which is that it dances outside of the symbolic and it permits a form of expression not tethered to phallic logic, right? And that, that becomes the humorous aspects of the drama of the purloined letter. So that's important. Um, okay, he's already mentioned that in the seminar, I think number six, right, of 18. Here is a well-made account of what distinguishes the letter from the very signifier which the letter carries with it, whereby it is not to make a metaphor of the epistle, for the tale consists in the spiriting away of the message whose letter voyages without it. 
I'm gonna make a note of this actually, this is very significant. Um, the tale consists of the spiriting away of the message whose letter voyages without it. So immediately we have a, um, a, a strong distinction made of two registers of logic. One is uh, sig signification, the message. And the second is the logic of the letter, which itself is uh, returning to its destination. The message is not returning to the destination because the message of the content is what? It, well, apparently it seems to be insignificant. So the letter has a kind of preeminence over the signification of the content, which of course is a total affront to logical positivism and many other um, epistemological traditions, right? This is part of the madness of uh, Lacan, right? Okay, so we're, we're all good so far. I take your, I take your silence to be a, a glorious Anglo-Saxon complicity. So we proceed amidst your complicity. My critique, were it possible to take it as literary, could bear, and I do give it a go, only on what Poe does in being a writer who forms such a message about the letter. It is clear that in not saying it as such therein, it is not insufficiently, but all the more rigorously that he confesses it. Okay. What is he confessing? He's confessing some higher logic of the letter. He's not confessing the higher meaning, because that's in abeyance. Nonetheless, the elision could not be elucidated by means of some feature of his psychobiography. Okay. If anything, the elision would rather be occluded by it. So that's a very interesting proposal apropos um, the function of the author. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, what grants Poe's uh, genius to 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 make this point about the status of the letter is has nothing to do with his psychobiography. So literally, there's no psychoanalytic <laughs> uh, subjective reason. Okay, and so the psychoanalyst who would who has scoured Poe's other texts, throws in her towel here. And that is a reference to, uh, I believe, Marie Bonaparte, who um, performed the most careful analysis of every single word that Edgar Allan Poe ever wrote. Okay. All right. My own text would be no more resolved by my psychobiography. Now he's making a comparison with himself. The wish I might, for example, make of finally being read properly. So to be read properly has nothing to do with my psychobiography. And now here I'm um, curious about this whole conflagration we're dealing with apropos Nietzsche and the latest biography of Nietzsche, <laughs> uh, given this point that Lacan is making about the insignificance of psychobiography, you see, right? Because for this, it would be necessary to develop what I understand the letter to carry so that it always arrives at its destination. So are we with you? Are we, are we, are we clear on this so far? Psychobiography um, is not the privileged angle by which we can ascertain how a great work of literature, and here Lacan is comparing his decree to the Perlone letter, how both always arrive at its destination. And what do we mean when he says the Akri always arrives at its destination? Well, I think we can understand this in the way in which Lacanians actually refer to the Akri. 
such that, and even like on himself, such that he treats it almost like a talisman in a way, um, where he has very little doubt about the inerrancy of his proposals. So he can reference a certain section of the decree with a certain confidence uh, that it's potential for um, producing certain effects uh, hold true. So I take him to make a kind of claim here, and I wonder if others agree that what he's really saying about the accrete always arriving at its destination is that the accrete performs like a certain um, duping effect on its reader, which is also goes back to the whole point that he made about how do not understand me through the mathemes first. Understand me first through the text, right? Through the text. Do not put the mathemes in a primary position. On the contrary, go to them and they will fail you. But in their failing of you, the letter always arrives at its this. Like, you see what I'm saying? There's some. Is this making sense what I'm saying? Do you remember what uh, Lacan famously says of the Acree, that he didn't writ write them in order for them to be understood, but only yeah. to be read? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. In, in other words, I, again, just to, to, to build on the point about why does the decree always arrive at its destination? Well, if you intend something, if we're talking about understanding, something can always go awry. Yes. Right. Um, meanwhile, if something is just written, well, it's written simply. There's no yeah. going wrong. Totally. I like this translation a lot, by the way. I feel very good with working with this. This is really exciting. Um, okay, that's very helpful. Okay, it is certain that as always, psychoanalysis is receiving here from literature, if it takes from it a less psychobiographical idea about repression in its veins, mainspring. Um, okay, does that make sense? Uh, as for me, if I propose to psychoanalysis the letter as being in abeyance, in souffrance, it is because psychoanalysis shows its failure there. And it is indeed through this that I shed light on psychoanalysis when I invoke in this way the enlightenment. It is to demonstrate where psychoanalysis constitutes a whole. It has been known for a long time. Nothing more important in optics and the most recent physics of the photon arms itself with it. Okay. Um, are we missing something here from him? No, I think it's just a long footnote, and that's why it's. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Think yeah. Going. Yeah. So this. Uh, well, let's look at the, the footnote. So, in an earlier version of the decree presented in seminar 18 on a discourse that might not be a sem block, um, this passage reads It is by this that I shed light on it, psychoanalysis, and one knows, one knows that I know, that I thus evoke. It is on the back of my volume, Lumiere. For that, I shed light on it by demonstrating where it makes a whole psychoanalysis. Lacan is here alluding to the notes on the back cover of the French edition of the Ecree, in which Lumiere, which can also be translated as insights or lights, seems to refer to Les Lumiere, the philosophers of the Enlightenment. Aha! The notes in question read as follows. It is necessary to have read this collection in its length to feel that a single debate is um, to feel that a, a single debate is being pursued in it. Always the same in which, if this need appearance to be given a date, is recognized to be the debate of the Lumiere. It is a domain where the sunrise itself tarries, that which proceeds via 
from a prejudice of which psychopathology is not clear based on the false evidence from which the ego entitles itself to strut forth from existence. The obscure passes in it for an object and flowers from the obscuritanism that rediscovers in it its values. No surprise, therefore, that one resists even the discovery of Freud there, a term extended here from an amph amphibology, the discovery of Freud by Lacan. The reader will learn what is demonstrated there. The unconscious arises from pure logic, in other words, from the signifier. Epistemology will always fail here if it does not take its departure from a reform, which is a subversion of the subject. Its advent can only be produced really and at a place that psychoanalysts hold at present. It is to transcribe the subversion from their most everyday experience that Lacan has worked for them for 15 years. The thing has too much interest for everyone for there to be no rumor of it. It is so that it might not come to be diverted by cultural commerce that Lacan has made these agree a call to attention. I wonder who wrote that. That's quite uh, bombastic and glorious and very interesting commentary on uh, on the on the the, 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 the fact that um, there is a there is a um, there is a, a title of a um, seminar well rather of a uh, collection from Umbra the Joan Kopchek journal um, on Lacan and the dark god right which is the inversion of the enlightenment qua illumination right so Lacan is not a Neoplatonist illumination precisely because of the innovation of his theory of the object A, which is this notion of the whole, right? Which I think is what he's really referencing here, right? Which is that uh, truth does not appear qua its instantiation in some form of um, psychobiographical epiphany or something like this, right? There's, it's on the side of a different form of void and so on, if that makes sense. Okay. It's, it's probably little... it's probably Jack Stone. Well, if Jack Stone wrote that, kudos to him because it's really well written. <laughs> yeah. It's really well written. It's really good. Um, I'll have to send him a note of congratulations. Um, what's going on? How are you, by the way, Andrew? Uh, good. I'm good. Thanks. I'm good. I'm thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. So, is this your first time reading uh, literature, or if you? So if yeah, this it is definitely. Cool, cool. Okay, I think we're doing good so far, people. So let us let us move on here. Okay, method through which psychoanalysis justifies better its intrusion. For if literary criticism could effectively renew itself, it would be because psychoanalysis is there for the text to measure themselves against it, and the enigma is on its side. Okay, I read that again. The method through which psychoanalysis justifies its better its intrusion, intrusion into the real, perhaps, or if literary criticism could effectively renew itself, it would be because psychoanalysis is there for the text to measure themselves against it. And the enigma being on the side of the texts. This is, this is a, a reference to Lacan's um, act of, what, what Thomas Savolo says in his latest, The Aims of Analysis, says it's almost an axiomatic of Lacan, of the late Lacan, which is that um, the artist, including the literary artist, poet, painter, etc., cetera, um, does have a privileged access point over the psychoanalyst um, to the symptoms of the time and so on, right? Um, so like, this was actually part of my critique in the Tupanamba seminar that we held of Miller. Because in my opinion, I don't really see Miller maintaining the same humility that Lacan had as it pertains to the privileging of people outside of psychoanalysis as being able to say something of novelty of truths for psychoanalysis, which is what, like Gabriel's one of his core things. You see my right? You see what I'm saying? 
um, I felt like Miller's school doesn't adequately open that space. And I feel that we students of psychoanalysis suffer from that because at least Lacan put literature and artists into conversation with psychoanalysis in really interesting ways, right? Because he had the kind of wherewithal and the courage to say that they knew something that he didn't, right? So anyways, I just don't see that much in contemporary Lacanian thought. Maybe, maybe you do, I don't know. Okay. Uh, this reminds me of, I just read a passage in Less, Less Than Nothing, uh, in which Shushek tells how psychoanalysis is the totally contrary of hermeneutics, because psychoanalysis relies on our interpretation, and hermeneutics relies on this deep truth, right? That maybe relates to how he's talking about uh, literary criticism, right? How yes. psychoanalysis is a different type of literary criticism that relies on interpretation of these X's, of course, that we were talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I think that's a good point, which is psychoanalysis doesn't quite, the analyst doesn't really produce on their own accord the, the dustbin of the litter. They, 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 they listen to it and they, 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 they um, shift a subject's orientation within within to towards it which is a different form of of what the artist does right the artist produces it literally right literally right or reinvents it right or gives a a new way to speak about the shame of life in a way you know now, I'm not, if I may say, I'm not entirely sure that the forum, the International Forum, or the Malarian School, either one of them, are really particularly a school of thought since uh, Lacan's death that I would characterize as particularly strong at exactly what you just described. I think, if anything, they have been, they represent particularly now rather conservative attitude towards the very question you're raising, both for both um, trajectories in general. I can't, I mean, that's just my impression that they yeah. don't, that yeah. neither one have a very good grasp of the very thing you're driving at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why like, it's the psychoanalyst who knows more about the political bond than the, than the, than the political militant does, which at least someone like Baju in, in the way that he um, creates the conditions of truth would never allow for such a pompous attitude to, to like the philosopher knows more about music than the musician. The, the philosopher knows more about um, I don't know, you know, the truths of mathematics than the than the than the mathematician, uh, you know, things like that. Like, yeah, this this whole this whole thing is an ethical failure, in my opinion. Yeah, um, there's a very and, strange discourse that's happened. Yeah, and I don't I know, know to, how to account for it. I mean, it's yeah. very easy for us to say it's become conservative. I think there's some kind of gap impasse here. I mean, generally speaking, so I don't know. Because it does seem different than Lacan's himself, his own language and discourse. After his death, the discourse of uh, that, even though I would say that in Miller's Analyst Banquet, which is a remarkable series of texts, it is. And Colette Soler's work is remarkable. But in yeah, both cases, in both cases, with both respect to both of their you know, groups, there tends to be a tendency towards this, you know, um, involvement of this kind of late, 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 late Lacanian emphasis on we're all mad. And what do we, how do we theorize given that we're all mad? And um, this kind of theorizing that really doesn't think about the artistic um, project in the way that you're talking about it. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or the political project. It thinks about the project of 
what does it mean to be mad? What, what does the real mean? I mean, they think about that all in a new way, then, you know, that is interesting, but they don't think about it generally in the way that you're driving at. Yeah, or, or they, yeah, I agree, Andrew. Or they, they don't, there's something um, of a failure of the extension of an olive branch of, 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 of a type of um, in, invitation or invocation for other figures of thought to animate the core project of psychoanalysis. So there's, there's a kind of a decollaboration, an evacu right. ev evacuation of psychoanalysis in its own capacity to speak to other discourses and other expressions and so on. Right. Uh, and I think that's a tragedy in a, in a way, um, because it's it represents a kind of fear, a fear of, of losing something, you know, a kind of, I don't know, um, it's maybe it's, it, it does have to do with the mad clinic insofar as the issue itself is an issue of a, of a deteriorating social bond, right? Yeah. Uh, may, yeah. So there's interesting things that play there. Okay. I'm. I'm currently reading uh, Rudinesco's Jacques Lacan and Co. Um, yeah. And this yeah. is a similar argument, which I think it's really interesting to contextualize this historically because Lacan, as he's coming up, is very overshadowed by the surrealists um, and by other clinicians at the time for a, a long time. And so Rudinesco's argument is that Lacan's brilliance lay not in actually just asserting a profoundly new theory like say Freud did, but in the cobbling, the cobbling together of the excesses and rubbish that is produced through the surrealist movement and other kind of uh, clinical ideas at the time, he is yeah. uniquely able to alter them by combining them creatively. Um, and so there has to be a deep respect for the artist there in order mm. to, um, to do that, right? I think also it's because psychoanalysis works better when it's marginal. And I, I saw this uh, psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst from Argentina. And as you might know, in Argentina, there are more psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts in the world than per capita, right? So he was saying that actually it was the worst thing that could happen for psychoanalysis in Argentina to, to become popular because uh, it's, it, it doesn't work uh, as Lacan would have thought, right? Psychoanalysis, he claims that psychoanalysis works better when it's marginal. And I th that might be the case, right? When to so the surrealist, and he was marginal to the surrealist, right? And to other clinicians. And that's how yeah. he worked. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't that a note on the surrealist? Uh, Daniel, are you familiar with Rosalind Krauss's The Optical Unconscious? What's the title? The Optical Unconscious. It's no, I'm not. Oslin Krauss's best book, um, in fact. Uh, she's one of the co-founders of October. Um, uh, basically, the, the, the guiding conceit of that book, or at least what it starts out from, is a kind of counter-narrative of modernism through Lacan's El Schema. Um, so like it, it starts off with this Klein group, which is like mapping like, you know, the kind of Greenbergian paradigm as it were, of, you know, um, categorical um, self-definition in the arts, right? Um, you know, this, this kind of perfect pellucid trans, you know, cognitive transparency, like epitomized by like color field painting or um, even like Mondrian, um, but then, bringing the surrealist to bear in Lacan's El Schema, yes, it, it shows that there's always this, you know, counter tendency in modernist art. And it's really, you know, given Lacan, again, Lacan's only affiliation with the surrealist, it really does shed light on a lot of, I think, his theoretical, you know, central theoretical concepts. And really like, again, like the El Schema or even the R Schema, like it provides a really intuitive, way of reading those. Hmm. Incredible, wow. And the author's name, Optical Unconscious, the author? Uh, Rosalind Krauss. Okay. 
Well, this is actually, I think, going to be raised shortly. At least, well, at least the, 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 the connection to surrealism is going to be raised because later in this text, as a foreshadow, Lacan says something apropos the semblant, which we've been studying, which is that um, the formula is the following. Only in avant-garde forms of artistic movements do you have a form of art which is uh, placating or uh, capable of a form of representation, let's say, that's beyond semblant, for which surrealism would be a part of. So that's um, very interesting. Okay. But those of whom it is not maligning to advance that rather than, than exercise in it, they are being exercised by it, at least when being taken as a body. Hear my words badly. Uh, for their benefit, I oppose truth to knowledge. It is the former, um, truth okay it is truth where they immediately recognize their office whereas when put through the mill it is their truth that i await so here he's talking about analysands particular type of analysand okay i insist on finding my range with a knowledge in failure uh as one says, a figure in abeyance, in, 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 in a beam. I, I think that would mean in abeyance. Is that right? A figure of... Um, in the background, generally. In the well. background. Okay, the a figure in... Okay. The frame within the frame. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's Which is why he. this is actually a subtle reference to the famous painting of the ambassadors, by the way. You know the painting that we're talking about here, which has the phallic object at the, the, the base of it, uh, which you can, you can kind of see, but then unsee, but then once you see it, you can't not see it. That's, that's actually, I believe, what the reference here is, by the way. Okay. So for their benefit, I oppose truth and knowledge. It is the former where they immediately recognize their office. Whereas when put through the mill, it is their truth that I await. I insist on finding my range with the knowledge in failure, as one says um, in the background. It is not the failure of knowledge. It's the failure of truth, okay. I learned then that one believes to be relieved from having to give proof of any knowledge. And he's also obviously talking here about subjects supposed to know. Yeah. Okay. And 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 further, we're now we're now seeing the logic of the um, uh, a letter returning to its destination through the analytic act itself. Would it be a dead letter when I put in the title of one of these pieces that I have called a creed of the letter the instance as the reason of the unconscious? Isn't this designating enough in the letter what in having to insist is not there by full right, no matter how strong it is being advanced with reason? To call this reason moderate or extreme is to show the befitity in which all measure is engaged. But isn't there anything in the real that does without this mediation? The frontier certainly in separating two territories symbolizes for them that they are the same for who crosses it, that they have a common measure. It is the principle of the Umwelt which reflects the, in the Innenwelt, the Innenwelt. So this distinction between the uh, two different types of worlds, right? the, 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 the um, um, 
how would we how would we define these these two distinctions? It's like the world exterior and the world interior to the subject. Is that fair? Would you say? Yeah, this is Uxkol, and so like the Umwelt is basically it, it's um, it's it's an animal's natural habitation. It's it's basic yeah. kind of disposition yeah, that's right. towards its environments. And then in yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Belt, I, I assume is only like it's it's interior, it's organs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. So um, let's go back to this. Okay. To call this reason moderate or extreme is to show the definity in which all measure is engaged. But isn't there anything in the real that does without this mediation? Why, why would he say, isn't there anything, or rather, isn't there? so there's nothing that does not um, mediate what exactly? The, the, the movement of the, of, the, of the letter itself, I think. Okay. I think for Lacan, you know, I, I, it's a kind of axiomatic that the real is always mediated. Yes, even as it's kind of the, um, you know, overarching horizon of his mm -hmm. whole development, according to Ayers. Um, I, I, again, his book, Lacan, The Concept of the Real, I've been reading recently, really brilliant. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, yes, it, 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 it's, it's without mediation. And OK, basically, the way I'd put this is, OK, what's our preoccupation here? It's the letter. The letter is in the real, and it's it, it, this bifidity. Again, I can't help but think of it conjointness with the signifier as its support, and yet at the same time, irreducibly distinct from it. Um, yeah. Yes, and marking out these two as, we'll get to the literal as a bit, yeah. but just to go ahead and touch on that. Well, well, I, I actually think the concept to understand what he's saying here of umwelt and innenwelt mm -hmm. is actually extimacy, because what he's really saying here is that it is the same from, from the subjective position when one crosses that divide. Because um, it is, the, the, the real touches both. There's, there's, no, um, there's no separation between the, 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 the status of some kind of inner authentic experience and the, the outer world that this subject inhabits. It's, it's a logic of extimate con connectivity in both ways. So if I read this again, that might make sense. The frontier certainly in separating two territories, the Umwelt and the Innenwelt, okay, uh, symbolizes for them that they are the same for who crosses it, that they have a common measure. It is the principle of the Umwelt which reflects the Innenwelt, annoying, this biology, which already gives itself everything from the very start, the fact of adaptation, notably, let's not talk about selection. It overtakes ideology in blessing itself with being natural. Okay. Oh, I just, Go ahead. Just a brief word on that. This idea, this is going to be a funny theme of these seminars. I think it's in 19 or 20 black says of natural selection, that it means nothing. Because what it means is whatever survived, survived. And he thinks it's kind of specious to read a kind of telos from this, like um, a lot of evolutionary theory does. And hence his, you know, um, why he takes exception with this idea of adaption. I mean, in, again, in subversion of the subject, he talks about, you know, um, Darwin does not, um, you know, uh, renounce, uh, uh, you know, um, dispense with man's belief that he is simply, that he is highest among the animals, for it's precisely this that Darwin convinces man of. Right. And, and of course, the signifier is not natural. So there's a distinction there between body qua natural and logic of signifier as a different register. And, and, and go ahead. 
Oh, yes. Uh, back to the connection by, between Innenwelt and Umwelt. I mean, yeah. Organs with regards to in and vote. And that's a good way to think about it because, you know, the way, uh, again, a lot of evolutionary theory thinks of organs as being preformed towards certain purposes. Lacan will always talk about, you know, organs being kind of artificially produced. You know, <laughs> the, this, this language you find throughout, for instance, Seminar 11, et cetera, you know, he, he talks about, you know, of course, part objects in form and the form. Yeah. Organs. They're not the totally. preformed purpose, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of the basis of polymorphous perversity itself, right? As a kind of constitutive theory of subjectivity for psychoanalysis, which, of course, the great, one of the greatest American psychoanalysts, Norman O. Brown, put all of his chips in on polymorphous subjectivity and created like an entire theory based around it, uh, which is which is sad that he's not read more today because I feel like in the zeitgeist of the current moment um, with huge emphasis on the body and so on and the imaginary and so on, I feel like Norman O. Brown should be having a renaissance right now, but he's not. That's unfortunate. Anyways, now he's going to talk about littoral, which we've looked at before. And remember before we read this that littoral is Lacan's uh, revision, okay, of the notion of quilting point. It's his revision of quilting point. So it's actually an extremely, or this is sort of a genealogical point or something like that that I'm making. I think it's super interesting because he's talking up here about the frontier of this division. And he's talking about the littoral. What is the littoral? It's a space where uh, there's no, it's, it's, a, it's a calm space at the meeting of two different forms of water. So like, you know, when you have like, uh, I don't know, like a, a river meets an ocean or fresh water meets um, salt water or something like this. It's a kind of inlet space of a neutrality where there's a non-relation and it's, Kind of nice to me because it's a way of thinking about the non non rapport in, in in this way okay okay all right the letter isn't it more appropriately littoral that is to say creating the figure that an entire domain is frontier for the other in that they are foreign to the point of not being reciprocal Okay. Just got to take a quick note on that. Because now yeah, he's also talking about this notion of alterity, um, which is very interesting. Okay. The edge of the whole in knowledge, isn't this what the letter outlines? This is a really good text, by the way. This is, this is like really amazing in my opinion. Um, and how could psychoanalysis, if precisely what the letter says literally, a la let, uh, through its mouth, one must not fail to grant it that, to grant it that. How could it deny that it is this whole by filling it? that psychoanalysis has a recourse to evoking jouissance there. What a masterful formula. <laughs> God, I love you. Okay. And how could psychoanalysis, if precisely what the letter says literally, a la let, through its mouth, so the, the slips and so on of the analysen, right? One must not fail to grant it, that how could it deny that it is this whole by filling it that psychoanalysis has recourse to evoking three songs there. Okay. So that makes sense that the, 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 the slips of the speech of the analyst sand open up these holes and that in a way 
they point to also miniatures of littoral divisions within the subject, we could say. Okay. It remains to be known how the unconscious, which I call effective language, in that it supposes its structure as necessary and sufficient, commands this function of the letter. Okay. That the letter is the proper instrument for writing discourse does not render it improper to designate the word taken for another, even by an other in the sentence, thus to symbolize certain effects of the signifier. But this does not impose that the letter is primary in these effects. Okay. An examination of this primacy, which is not even to be supposed, does not impose itself, but rather of what in language calls the literal to the literal. Uh, okay, to the An examination of this primacy, which is not even to be supposed, does not impose itself, but rather of what in language calls the literal to the literal. I see. So literal is a play on literal, but it also designates this division point that I mentioned before. But I think also he's making something, some commentary about what literal speech reveals, apropos of these holes in knowledge. Um, I suppose that they are riddled with the real in a way you could say. Okay. What I have inscribed by means of letters of the formations of the unconscious in order to recuperate them from that which Freud formulates them for being what they are, effects of the signifier, does not authorize making a letter into a signifier nor to affect it, what is even more with primacy in relation to the signifier. Such a confused discourse could only have arisen from the discourse which imports me, but imports me in another which I spell out time come as the university discourse, that is to say, as knowledge put to use from semblance. Um, okay. The slightest feeling that the experience I am coping with can only be situated from another discourse should have prevented its being produced without confessing that it is mine. That I am being spared from it, thank God, does not preclude that in importing me in the sense I have just said, I am being importuned. Had I found acceptable the models which Freud articulates in a project, which is his text on a project of scientific psychology? What is it? Uh, the total? Well, I forget the full title. Um, scientific psychology. Is that what it is? Yeah. In breaching routes of impression, I would not for all that have taken from it a metaphor of writing. Writing is not the impression with all due respect for the magic writing pad. This is an essay of Freud's. When I take advantage of the 52nd letter to fleece, it is to read therein what Freud could express with the term he forges um, of whiz. Wern Mungeisen, Musiken, pardon my German pronunciation is poor there, but as close as possible to the signifier at the time when Saussure has not yet reproduced it from the Stoic signons. All right, so he's referring here um, to Freud's theory in the magic writing pad about um, the signifier of writing itself and the Stoic signons, which is the first time he's referenced this, so I'm not clear on exactly what he means by that. Okay. That Freud writes it with two letters does not prove any more than it does in my case that the letter is primary. I will thus try to indicate, indicate the gist of what appears to me to produce the letter as consequence 
end of language, precisely in what I say, that who speaks inhabits it. I will borrow the traits from what in an economy of language allows one to outline what promotes my idea that literature perhaps turns to literate. Literature perhaps turns to literate. People will not be surprised to see me proceeding there from a literary demonstrations, since this is in line with what produced the question. Through which, however, it can be affirmed what such a demonstration is. Okay, now he's getting into this whole Japan um, trip that he made and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's see if we can manage this. I've just returned from a voyage to Japan I have been looking forward to making because of what during the first one I had experienced of the literal. One should understand the allusion to what I repudiated a moment ago in the Umwelt as rendering the voyage impossible. Thus, from one angle, according to my formula, ensure it's being real, yet prematurely, for only by rendering impossible, but through mystial, the departure, that is to say, at the very most, the signing of partons. What is partons? I'm not sure what that is. Maybe somebody could find that for us. I shall merely note the momentum I gained from a new routing in that I was no longer forbidden like the first time. I nonetheless confess that it was not during the outbound journey along the Arctic Circle by aircraft that what I saw of the Siberian plain gave me something to read. My present essay, insofar as it could be entitled on a cyber, on a Siberia ethics, would thus not have seen the light of day had the distrust of the Soviets let me see the cities, even the industries, the military installations which give Siberia its value to them. But this is only an accidental condition, although perhaps to a lesser extent, if I call it occidental, to indicate that the accident of the carnage. So he's playing with Siberia and it's kind of no man's land and it's prohibition by the uh, Soviets. Uh, and he's playing with that to the very idea of littoral and how um, the literalness of the speech of the NLSN produces many zones of littoral, as well as um, his experience of his own umwelt is dysphoric when he travels to a foreign country, which we've all experienced before. Okay. The only decisive thing is the littoral condition. And this one only played a part on the return journey in being literally what Japan had no doubt done to me with its letter. This little bit too much, which is just what is needed for me to feel it. Since after all, I had already said that it is that by which its language long is eminently affected. No doubt this too much is related to what art is conveying about it. Let me refer to the fact of what painting demonstrates there about its marriage to the letter, more precisely in the form of calligraphy. How am I to say what fascinates me in these things hanging, kakimono, as it is being peddled, hanging on the walls of every museum in those places, bearing inscriptions of characters, Chinese descent, which I know a little, but which however little may I know them, enable me to measure what is being elided from them in the cursive, or the singularity of the hand crushes the universal, that is to say precisely what I teach you as applying only to the signifier. Um, I can't find it anymore, but that's because I am a novice. Apart from that, this is not where the importance lies, for even when this singularity supports a more stable form and adds to it the dimension, the dimension, I have already said, the dimension of the nomo uh, radwan, uh, the one from which is evoked what I install of the subject in the one more, and that it furnishes the anxiety of la chose, the thing, that is to say what I connote with the small a is the object here. But in being the stake of which wager that is one with ink and brush. Okay. 
so he's yeah, in typical form. He's being kind of um, cute uh, here. Um, and I, I, I hope that you follow these in part because the thing was a focus of seminar three. Demansion was mentioned in seminar two of seminar 18 as well. So hopefully some of these are now by now familiar to us. Okay. Okay. Um, and then there's a long footnote as well. Okay. But for purpose of time, I'll move through this in part also because I'm getting a little tired. I don't know how y'all are doing, but um, uh, we're close to being done. I think we have about 20 more sessions. As such, it appeared to me irrefutably, this circumstance is not to be sneezed at from between the clouds, the shimmering course, only traced to appear by operating there rather than indicating the plane's relief in this latitude. In what of Siberia constitutes a plane, a plane devoid of any vegetation other than reflections, which push into shadow what does not mirror back from it. The shimmering course is a Bouquet of the first trait and what effaces it. I have said it. It is from their conjunction that the subject is made. But in such a way that two moments are being marked. It is thus necessary for the erasure to be distinguished in it. Erasure of no trace whatsoever that is prior. This is what constitutes the land. Terre of the littoral. Ah, uh, now it's coming together, you see. <laughs> Pure latura, that is the literal, to produce this erasure. This is a super significant section here. To produce this erasure is reproducing this half without complement of which the subject subsists. Such is the exploit of calligraphy. If you try to do this horizontal stroke, which is traced from left to right in order to depict with the trait, the unary one as a character, you will take a long time to discover which pressure it requires and which suspension it stops. To tell the truth, it is hopeless for a Western causality, for a Western casualty. One needs a train there, which can only be caught if it is being detached from whatever runs through you. Between center and absence, between knowledge and true songs, there is literal. Between center and absence, between knowledge and true songs, there is literal, which only turns to the literal insofar as this turn can take it in the same way at each and every moment. It is only through this that you can take yourself as the agent sustaining it. So all of this makes sense to me with the exception of the literal. Is he mean by that the subject's attempt to render full meaning or to to speak full meaning, like we talked about before with Poe and how the in abeyance is precisely the full signification of the content of the what's inside. Is that how you all understand the literal, like that the effort on behalf of the subject to bring that into discourse produces this split of the literal, which is a split between knowledge and truth, which is also to say the truth, since it is of truissance, is also a split between knowledge and truissance. Does that kind of make sense to you what I just said? How are you how are you thinking this? I mean, I'll be I'll admit to being just like it's 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 too much, but um, 
Um, no, I did recognize this exact quote, however, from the Sumic article and promptly brought that up. And after quoting this, she follows up literal by activating the void itself as a mediator is certainly a way of relating to jouissance, which can do without the semblant. On the other hand, when Lacan posed a rhetorical question, is it possible for the littoral to constitute such a discourse as characterized by not being issued from the semblant? His answer is clearly no. The littoral can only testify to the fracture of that which it is itself an effect, but is unable to affect the cut. Only discourse can affect the cut. Um, yeah. And only she ends this like a few lines later by saying the literal proposes itself as a virgin canvas on which new combinations among the real imaginary and the symbolic can be inscribed. The virgin canvas is a particularly, you know, like um, suggestive figure here given his evocation of the vast, yeah. you know, inside the area. That's very helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, this is um, a little more difficult to, 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 to study precisely because it is a written text, right? This, this transmission is more dense precisely because it is a written text versus the seminar, even though of course the seminars um, are, are not a walk in the park. Okay. Uh, let us continue. I think that this obviously is the 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 the, the literal is now becoming much more apparent. It's something which is produced from an antinomy. It's something which is produced from this division, uh, from this exposure of the real. So I'm getting getting a lot from this. Okay. What is revealed I, by my- I do want to say, I mean, can I say something quick? Please, yeah, of course. Just that I think that, you know, the question earlier in it, he's raising the question of surplus jouissance. Precisely, he locates that as a, as a how does he put it? It's like located as a, as a um, sliding um, a movement within the, the discourses. Like he's very emphasizes that as something to essentially understand that surplus jouissance with it, because he's he emphasizes earlier on that this the whole emphasis of this seminar is to understand that we're dealing with an issue of an economy. So that the whole question is where is the the action of the agent? Yeah. You know, here, right now, he's asking, he's really trying to pinpoint at what point is there an something of an ethical a sense of agency, right? So he's saying here that, the, that there is a point of an agent that we can harness with the literal, the, you know, the difference here. Yeah. It resonates for me a little bit earlier where he pinpoints very precisely, it's important to understand that the action of surplus resonance operate, operates as a slipping, I'm trying to, I wrote it down somewhere, a slipping thing that operates metonomically across yes. the, um, the, the discourses, the four discourses and in semblance. So we're always in this realm of semblances and yet it up, so he's sort of sketching it out. And now we're getting to the later section here. He's trying to nail down the action of agency precisely at this action here at the literal. It's a kind, a kind of a strange point here. Anyway, I just wanted to point on that moment. Yeah. It, it resonates. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because uh, um, the, the, the quilting point was a solution to the division between knowledge and truth or to the division between knowledge and truissance in which um, the signifier had a kind of um, rapport or kind of a hook in which um, symbolization could occur and yeah. so on. And, and here, um, the symptoms of the analyst sand uh, begin in 
semblance, but have the potential to become centomes. Because remember, we haven't mentioned this yet, but it's very important to do so, that, and, and um, Thomas's new book, Savolos's new book makes this very clear, and the Malarians make this very clear, which is that the late Lacan will uh, uh, pit the uh, Samblon uh, uh, to, to the Santon, right? And so mm -hmm. the, 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 the act of analysis has everything to do with swapping out your kind of inefficient, or not inefficient, but your kind of, um, yeah, your, 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 your fetishized attachment. And of course, the neurotic, the psychotic, they all have different ways that they, that they, that they, that they attach to the Samblon. But the task is to, of course, invent a sent home. Uh, 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 in lieu of that or in replacement of that, right? So I think that's a super thing to keep centered here. And that, um, right. that there, yeah, that, 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 that even furthermore, there's something of a, of a, of a non-relation um, that the discourses uh, fail because the discourses are a story of a certain form of inadequacy, which is why he said above, that you can't just remain within one alone. There's an inadequacy of one which leads to the other, right? There's a kind of inner relation between the four, which is why he says that it takes the speaking being and it puts them on all fours. The discourse is put you on all fours, mm -hmm. literally, right? With the exception yeah. of the discourse of the capitalist, like you become a different kind of animal with that discourse, right? Like it. <laughs> It permits um, paradoxical errors and so on. Like where, you, it, because it is a form of master's discourse unto itself, it's all that you need, or it can be all that you need. Which is why I actually disagree with some Lacanians who say that the capitalist discourse is just a seamless, uh, ambiguous discourse because it kind of can run alongside. No, I actually think actually the, the horror of our world is actually that in some instances, subjectivity can be consumed purely by it in a certain way. Right. Um, anyways, that's a whole, sorry for the tangent, but no, no, I think in this seminar, I mean, my reading is that he's definitely putting it without a doubt that this is our environment. He's very much saying that it would be naive of any reader or listener of this seminar to not understand that he's presuming that the condition of our society now is capitalist discourse. Yeah, I agree. I think this is missed by a lot of Lacanian analysts. Mm -hmm. I don't. I think that they they don't see that. They don't see the centrality of of what he's saying about it. Remember. The same year that this comes out, he gives the famous Milan speech on the capitalist discourse, by the way. So you're totally right that this is central for him at this time. I totally agree. He's quite sarcastic about it. He says it quite a number of times in this seminar. I know. Yeah, it's very serious. Okay. Anyway. Let's see if we can let's see if we can plow ahead for the next 10 minutes and then we'll break um, at 10. Okay. What is revealed by my vision of the shimmering course in that erasure dominates there is that in being produced from between the clouds, it joins its source in that it is indeed to the clouds that Aristophanes calls me in order to find what the signifier is all about. That is to say, semblance our excellence. If it is through its rupture that rains down from it, effect insofar as what precipitates from it, what was matter in suspension there? Jesus Christ. Oh my God. Well, first of all, you know, he's talking about Socrates here, right? This is the whole business of don't have your head in the clouds, which is anytime anybody says that to you, it's a, a veiled reference to the play of which was deriding Socrates called the clouds. 
right? Because he's up in the uh, the forms, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting what he says about semblance there too, and raining down the effects and so on from the 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 kind of rupturing of it and so on. Okay, that's very nice. And here we could obviously invoke Lacan's whole conversation, which we talked about before, of Jeremy Bentham and the theory of fictions. By the way, okay because I think that I'm trying to write a paper about this business of Lacan's reading of Bentham's fictions in light of the later literal theory of, of, of nominalism, right? Okay, this rupture which dissolves what constituted form, phenomenon, meteor, and of which I have said that science operates in probing its aspect, operates in probing its aspect, Okay. Isn't it also the case that it is to expel what of this rupture might constitute trissance in that the world or equally the filth has a drive there to give shape to life? Okay. So the rupture of the semblant of the clouds is what is Trissant's itself is the signifier uh, it is indeed to the clouds that Aristophanes calls me in order to find out what the signifier is all about so in other words uh, my teaching can only be taken insofar as it's a semblant or any, any, any discourse of mine has as a precondition, uh, has to be taken up as semblant. Okay, very fine. And he's making kind of a, a veiled allusion to the, the whole notion that philosophically we can only speak about it there. Okay, but then the rupture, um, the rupture is precisely what? I guess you could say it's unclear. In some sense, he's talking about a return to the litter. The, 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 the. But I'm a, I'm a little uneasy with this because I'm having one of these moments in reading Lacan where I'm having an overload of qualifying and specifying <laughs> um, precisely what the operation is conceptually speaking, because there's too many possible candidates for the cause of the rupture here. Okay. What is evoked of jouissance insofar as a semblance is broken? Okay, see, I spoke too soon. Now he's gonna explain it. All right, what is evoked of jouissance insofar as a semblance is broken? This is what is presented in the real as gullying. What does it mean to gully? Well, wait, the, in the other translation, it's also as a furrowing. But anyway, and in the other. That's interesting. Yeah. And in the French, I don't speak French well enough, but it says ravinement. Comme ravinement. Oh, ravinement. Anyway. I wonder, well, there's two, there's two furrow, there's, there's one furrowing and two gullying in the yeah. English. I know ravinement is the same French term for furrows in the elithiosphere from seminar 17. You remember that? Yeah. Furrows in the elithiosphere. You remember that? Yeah. That's a beautiful one where for the first time Lacan introduces this um, notion of the latouze of, of, yeah. of, of uh, these, these, these uh, certain way that the reign of technology affects um, our enjoyment in our speech, right? And, and the way we become attached to certain technological objects and the way that that hollows out a certain part of our being. It's a mm -hmm. very Heideggerian reflection. It's a very short seminar in 17, but nonetheless, a very interesting one. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting that there's a furrowing what is evoked of jouissance insofar as a semblance is broken? 
this is what is presented in the reel as so furrowing. it's like a driving out a hole again right so it's like yeah yeah uh-huh that makes sense yeah so when and it when, has reference please and it has reference to uh the soil uh Robin Van is like erosion so to topology too right yeah yeah very nice yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Siberia, the terre, the earth, litera terre, right? Um, there's all of these allusions going on as well, um, which just invites a whole paper analysis and so on. Um, yeah, so go on. So now we have the potential okay. signifier yeah. because we have the potential okay. of the S1, S2 here, see? Yeah, okay. It is of the same effect that riding is in the real, the gulling of the signified, what has rained down from semblance in as much as it constitutes the signifier. Okay, so think also of the letter, the sealed letter in the purloin letter, which remember, um, does never, the signified, is never revealed, but the effects rain down, you could say, from its semblance, right? Okay, and it constitutes a certain discourse, okay? Um, writing does not copy the signifier, um, but its language affects what is forged from it by who speaks it. Writing does not copy the signifier, but it's language. So when I read writing, put it into language, effects of it, what is forged from that, it, what is forged from that, those effects is by who speaks it. Okay. Just if you could, if I could just suggest, if you read the one next to it, it also helps a little bit because it creates a little bit of a poetic image. What is this one here? By, yeah. All right. If you go, it writing is, does not trace the signifier, but it, yeah, the, from their part, yeah. Okay. Writing does not trace the signifier, but its effects of language, what is forged by whoever speaks it. It only climbs back in taking a name there. Um, as happens in those effects among things that signify battery names to have them numbered. Okay. You know what, this is really back to the very first day where he talked about the right names, the right arms, I mean, and that whole parable of the piles of the arms and the, you know, and the moving yeah. of the territories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see what uh, Danny Nobis says. Writing only moves up again there by taking a name as it happens to those effects amongst the things which the signifying battery denominates in having enumerated them. Okay. Yes, signifying battery denominates in having enumerated them. Um, right, because in other words, there's no isolated pure signification that's not possible because if you if you hold that view you would hold the view that there is a meta language but since there's not a meta language this is off the table so anytime that the so therefore the primacy of signification falls on the signifying battery i.e the multiplicity of signifiers that determine that one signifier, which is not to be understood in isolation. That's how I read that. Okay. Yeah. Later from the aircraft could be seen sustaining themselves as isobars, albeit slanting down from the embankment, other traces that were normal relative to those with which the highest inclination of the relief marked itself with water courses. Have I not seen in Osaka how the motorways are placed one on top of the other like gliders from the sky? Furthermore, over there, the most modern architecture merges with the ancient to make itself into the wingbeat of a bird. 
how could the shortest pathway from one point to another have shown itself if not with the cloud pushed along by the wind insofar as it doesn't change its course? Neither the amoeba nor man nor the branch nor the fly nor the ant would have constituted an example before light appeared to be in solidarity with the universal curvature, the one whereby the straight line is only sustained by inscribing distance amongst the effective factors of a waterfall dynamics. Okay. There is, and he's, so he's basically trying to say that these, that the predominance of the battery of signifiers is also what determines meaning in nature. Okay. There is but a straight line by virtue of writing as there. You could just clarify before you go on. You, you're, you asked, what does that mean, the, the furrowing in the real? <clears throat> Go ahead. Does anyone have um, anything more to say on that? Because, uh, yeah, because I don't know, it feels like maybe this is what it's addressing now. Um. Let me find it, hold on. Can I just add that it relates, I think a little bit, maybe Daniel can add the, um, the in radiophony, he makes it very clear that he's talking about, you know, in, uh, we talked about this earlier, that the, um, the um, you know, in the, because of the discovery of Newtonian physics, we're in, we're in an era of the, uh, the, the relationship of the real to the, 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 the physics of the universe makes it possible that all kinds of um, reals are possible. It's no, so we're beyond, I'm not saying this very well, but we're, it's not, it's, there's the real of the sort of psychological real that psychoanalysis is concerned with. And then there's also the scientific real. So we're in the realm of sort of two phenomena of the real that he's in a way talking about that yeah. we have to deal with as modern beings. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. And I also think that furrowing is the drive of what we might even call death drive because one way to understand the furrowing or the, the, the real as drive is like a pulsion, which what is a furrow, like a, like, a, like a mole furrows its way to the surface of the earth, right? So if we read the section immediately before this phrase that I have highlighted, he says, this rupture dissolves what made form phenomenon, meteor of which I have said science operates to pierce the appearance. Would not this be also to discharge that which of this rupture would make jouissance in that the world, as well as in filth, there is a drive to figure life. So I think he's talking about a certain form of drive in the real. That is one way to understand both the way semblant is broken, the way jouissance appears, the way the literal appears, it's this, it's this pulsional drive. That's what I would say, Kayam, at the moment. But I, I think we need to finish the whole text before we're able to kind of get a kind of 360 okay. degree grasp on it. It sounds, it sounds like what we just, what you just the reading now, you know, um, another cartographic, uh, uh, you know, this entire piece. Yeah, it's, it's so fun how he's, it's as if he's writing <clears throat> topography and yeah, the furrow yeah, is, yeah, yeah. So thank you. No, you're right. It's like a travel log, like a, 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 a literal, a literal <laughs> travel log to topological analysis of the earth. It's, uh, it's so rich. Um, it's, it's really incredible. Okay. Can I just add that it's interesting how he says furrowing and not furrows, 
right? It's a verb, like the dead drive, right? That is something that is ongoing. And it's not just like a hole, but it's yeah, like holding. Yeah. yeah. That's why that's why I think it's really referring to death drive, to be honest, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you know what's also really real? Just one last comment is it is it reminds me of Moses in monotheism where he he thinks about migration of birds actually in Moses in monotheism. Anyway, side note, which was his last yeah. book, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so speaking of birds, okay, have I not seen in Osaka how the motorways are placed one on top of the other like gliders from the sky? Furthermore, over there the most modern architecture merges with the ancient to make itself into a wing beat of a bird. Okay. Um, how would the shortest pathway from one point to another have shown itself if not with the cloud pushed along by the wind insofar as it doesn't change its course? How would the shortest pathway from one point to another have shown itself if not with the cloud? So how would it, yeah without the semblant being ruptured, is how I read that. Neither the amoeba, nor man, nor the branch, nor the fly, nor the ant would have constituted an example before light appeared to be in solidarity with the universal curvature, the one whereby the straight line is only sustained by inscribing distance among the factors of a waterfall dynamics. There is but a straight line by virtue of writing. So writing, therefore, is capable of creating a discourse that might not be semblant, by the way. That's one way to think about writing, okay? Which in this case is a straight line, okay? Um, it's, yeah, okay. So an unruptured semblant maybe. But writing as well as land surveying are artifacts. Here we go, artifacts again. But writing as well as land surveying are artifacts in that they inhabit only language. How could we forget it when our science is only operative through a shimmering course of small letters and graphics combined with each other? Wow. Uh, so les ponts Mirabeau certainly as under that with which a journal which was mine made a signboard for itself i'm not sure what this reference is to exactly it's a uh, this may be the 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 um surrealist journal that's from many many years ago that he's referencing if it could be that uh, borrowing this ear bridge from Oro polo uh so they pump marabou yes uh, sign primitive, and it is a scene. So, oh, here we go. Okay, yeah. Such that the Roman fifth of the hour, see the wolf man may strike there. See the wolf man. Okay. Um, so he's running two references here, which we'll see in a minute. But then again, one only enjoys it in the speech of interpret. If the speech of interpretation reigns down there. Okay. Which, by the way, he thought was uh, Freud's masterpiece case study. Right. Um, so we should keep this formula in mind. The speech of interpretation raining down is the rupturing of Semblant. So if you think of Semblant as that which covers over the void or that which is a fetish object that covers over the real, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the speech of interpretation is the fragments of that disintegration. Um, okay. And it's also interesting to think that the littoral is also found in that rupture of the semblant as well. Okay, okay. That the symptom institutes the order which our politics confirm implies on the other hand that all that is being articulated of this articulated of this order is liable to interpretation what a beautiful formula see i swear to god man this this a formula like this just makes lacan an absolute master for me it's just so okay that the symptom institutes the order 
which our politics confirm implies on the other hand that all that is being articulated of this order is liable to interpretation. So what does he mean by that? He means by that, I think. Ways. Right? Yeah, what do you say more? What do you mean? What do you mean? It, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's like the glove can turn either, you can turn inside out and you would, like if you, like it's the symptom of a person, it's just the order which our politics confirm implies yeah. on the other hand that yeah. all that is being articulated yeah. of this order is liable to interpretation. You can turn it either way. You would analyze the system as such, and you will find the symptoms in an individual person equally as you would turn it the other way. Right. No, it's the glove. It works both ways. You can see that. I, I, I totally agree. I, I also, I also. Mar Mar psycho Marxism rather. Well, no, no, no. I, I also think that if um, truth is something which is found in the fragments of a, of a dialectic, which is composed based on a rupture of an instable semblance at all times. Um, politics therefore becomes just interpreting the, 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 the multiplicity of these errors of these, of, of basically we could say of kind of like shards of ideology that fall down on us, right? Like you, you, right. it's kind of like that. Okay, yeah. but listen, listen to this next one. This is very good. This is why one is indeed right in putting psychoanalysis at the head of politics. And this may not be an easy, this is like one of those quotes that I should put at the beginning of my book. Uh, this is why one is indeed right in putting psychoanalysis at the head of politics. And this is why, sorry, and this may not be an easy task at all for what has passed hitherto for politics if psychoanalysis appeared to be informed of it. Um, yeah, okay. I'm not sure what he's saying there actually. <laughs> I take that back. Um, I, okay. Uh, what is he saying there? That's interesting. Hmm. Um, I see. Okay. Okay. This okay. This may not be an easy task at all for what is hitherto passed for, but if science appeared to be informed. Of I think, I think I understand. I think I understand it now. What he's saying is that if politics was primary as the, 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 the discourse that privileged its own form of interpreting the reign of semblance, then psychoanalysis would be something subservient to it. And that's impossible. So in that sense, psychoanalysis does have an interpretive edge i.e. it must be at the head of poli ahead of politics or at the head. But that does, that's only means of, a, of an interpretive head. That's it's what, not what Andrew was saying, right? It's not both ways. Like what Andrew was saying before, like both ways you can work for politics to psychoanalysis or from psychoanalysis to politics. But it's exactly the opposite, right? Because with psychoanalysis, you work from the individual, from the particular, right? And that's how you use you and the, you interpret the excess, not from the other side, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're saying the same thing, Luis. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, let's, well, we have to break soon. Let's see how much more do we have here? I just want to get our bearings straight. So we actually have a sufficient amount. I think what we should do here is break and finish the, the, the rest. I think we are three fourths of the way through it, if not a little more. And I propose that we uh, meet up next Thursday. And what I would also say, since I think next Thursday will kind of be our last day in a way, um, please also read 
the final two sections. And what I'd like to do is finish this and then have a general conversation about those final two sections. So read the final two seminar days and bring relevant notes and I'll make my own relevant notes and we can discuss all that. Because I have some other reading groups that I wanna initiate and I think this one is, I think one more day should be sufficient for a seminar 18 in my, in my view. Um, oh, and so we'll close um, with that. And let me say one more thing. 